turn first then to Luke at chapter 9, and we start at verse 28. Luke 9, verse 28, which must have happened somewhere around the year 33 A.D. Some eight days after these sayings, he took along Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah, who, appearing in glory, were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep, but when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two, man, two men standing with him. And as these were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not realizing what he was saying. While he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and reported to no one in those days any of the things which they had seen. So that's our first passage, an event that happened a, a few weeks before Christ's death in about 33 AD. And now we turn to our text, to, one, uh, to 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1, and we will read verse 12 and following. I see that was my mistake here, that I said it's one, but it's 2 Peter, 2 Peter 1, and we will start at verse 12. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present in you. I consider it right, as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. And then here is our text. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were on with him on that holy mountain. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture 
is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Amen. Thus far our reading. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, what are your and my views about Christ's return? Yes, do you really believe? Are you in your heart of heart convinced that in God's right time, He will appear in power as judge supreme to whom all human beings will have to give an account? Also you and I. Do you realize that there are millions of people who don't believe this? And they even show this with their godless and godifying words and actions? For example, some people might talk lightheartedly and jokingly about doomsday or judgment day and about hell. And then they think they are very cool. I mean, have you, for example, ever wondered what sort of mindset the Wainuio Mata man had who started up the Hell's Pizza Company some 26 years ago? Could anyone who has a heartfelt reverence for God triune choose such a name for his business and call the names of his pizzas by the seven deadly sins and use other Bible-mocking symbols and numbers in their advertisements? Perhaps you say, but pastor, we are not like that. I'm not like that. I will never do that. You may be right. You and I may never openly joke about Christ's return and judgment day. But what does your and my everyday living reveal about our thoughts of the ultimate judge, the ultimate authority to whom we will have to give an account one day? Do you and I live who we claim we are? Children of God, people who love the Lord. You know, the Apostle Peter took this very seriously. That's why he, carried along by the Holy Spirit, wrote down the words of our text to his first readers and to all Christians. And this is effectively what Peter says. Dear Christian, don't you Ever listen to those who say that Christ will not return? That what he and we have told you concerning his return, that these are all nonsense and mere fabricated stories. Yes, don't you ever believe that? For it is vital for your eternal salvation to take Christ's return seriously. I mean, when he comes again, Christ will, as he said, come this time not as Savior, but as judge. Look, says the Apostle Peter, on highest authority, I, Peter, am now giving to you two grounds on which you should believe and continue to believe that Christ will come again as judge. My brother and sister, here are the two grounds, and they form the two points of the sermon. Eyewitnesses. And the second point, trusted prophecy. First then, eyewitnesses. My brother and sister and dear children, Peter's message can be paraphrased as follows. Dear Church of Christ, 
I have been one of the three inner circle disciples of Christ when he walked on earth. Yes, I was one of the three witnesses who had a preview of what Christ will look like when he returns in power and glory. Yes, the three of us had a preview of Christ the judge. So, as eyewitness of that real historical event, I know what I'm talking about. However soon you won't have me anymore, for I'm about to be killed for my faith, says Peter, just as Christ once promised me. And so, because my days on earth are nearly over, I now report in writing for you and for future generations what John, James, and I myself once saw in person. And that is the transfiguration or the transformation of Christ. Indeed, says Peter, on that mountain of transfiguration, God allowed for the three of us the privilege of seeing Christ in full glory, exactly as he will look like on Judgment Day. My brother and sister, let's briefly reflect upon that historical event, the transfiguration of Christ. Where and when did that happen? And why did it happen? Well, it happened a few weeks before Christ was crucified. And it happened way up north in northern Galilee on the highest mountain of that region. And that means it happened far away from Jerusalem or south and Golgotha where he was going to be crucified. And I once had the privilege of participating in a three-week archaeological expedition at the foot of that very high mountain, Mount Meron. Well, straight after this transfiguration event, Christ and his disciples started walking the nearly 200 kilometers to Jerusalem so that by God's decree, Christ could be crucified for our sins. But firstly, you and I have to ask the question, what did Christ look like when he was transfigured? And now God's word tells us that his face and clothes were shining out light. Yes, they were not just reflecting light as Moses' face once did when he had been in God's presence. No, Christ's face and clothes were beaming out light, a clear sign of his power and glory. Yes, exactly the way he will look like one day when he returns as judge in power and glory. See why verse 16 of our text makes a connection between Christ's coming, also known in theology as his parousia, his coming, and his power? A question. What was God's purpose with this event? Why did God think it necessary to transfigure or transform Christ in glory, and that even in the presence of the three inner circle disciples? The answer is at least twofold. Firstly, because in love for his Son, God the Father was by this transfiguration of Christ strengthening him for his imminent cross death. It's as if the father was saying, my son, you will one day be glorified as I have now for a few minutes glorified you. So 
Take this, which I have now done with you, as a reassuring foreshadowing of what you will be like one day. Yes, take this transfiguration as an overture of the wonderful glory which you will have when I, in absolute faithfulness, will, will raise you from the dead, and when you ascend into heaven, and also one day when you will return as judge to judge the living and the dead. My brother and sister, see, see how by giving his son a foretaste of what the son would look like after his victory over Satan and death, the son was strengthened, the son was motivated for the cross. He is for that most difficult road to victory. But secondly, why did God allow Peter, John, and James to personally witness Christ in glory and power? Well, was it not to strengthen also their faith for when they would see their Lord there suffering on the cross a few weeks into the future? And was it not also to make Peter, John, and James eyewitnesses who would strengthen the church? Yes, so that the church would have the privilege of having an eyewitness account of Christ's power and glory, exactly the way Christ will look at his return. Well, look, those three disciples, they were not just eyewitnesses. No, they were also ear witnesses. I mean, was it not to make things even clearer to them that God the Father spoke in a loud voice there on that mountain while his transfigured son appeared in glory before them? And what did the Father say? Yes, what did those three eye and ear witnessing disciples hear? Verse 17. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And then according to the Gospels, also Luke, which we have read, the Father also added, listen to him. And so with these words, God from heaven was confirming for the three witnessing disciples that this Christ in power and glory, whom they are now seeing before their very own eyes, is indeed that long-promised Messiah. Yes, that ultimate prophet about whom Moses once said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him. You shall listen. My brother and sister, remember what else those three disciples experienced on that mountain. The cloud of God's presence. God's so-called Shekhinah. Yes, similar to when God's presence once in Moses' day enveloped Mount Sinai. See, see how Peter, as eyewitness to this great event, was able to present this for what it is, even though it's now 30 years later, to present it for what it is, a true and real historical fact. Yes, see how in God's grace, Peter presents this true historical fact as grounds on which his readers and you and I should believe and keep on believing that Christ, whose glorious judge stature they once had a preview of, will return, as also he himself often said in much clearer terms. Question. Will all people be persuaded by historical facts 
also by this historical fact, the fact of Christ's transfiguration? Will they be persuaded by the eyewitnesses' fact, which also John refers to in 1 John 1, when he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have intently looked at, and our hands have touched. Will they be persuaded by the Apostle Paul's eyewitness facts of 1 Corinthians 15, that after Christ had risen from the dead, he appeared, he was seen by Peter, and then by the twelve, and he appeared once to more than 500 of brothers at the same time. Most of them were still alive as Peter was writing 1 Corinthians. Then he appeared to James again. Then he appeared to all the apostles again. And last of all, he appeared to Paul himself. Will people believe these eyewitness testifying facts? Sadly, no. Not all will believe. I mean, does not God's word say, 1 Corinthians 2, the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Thus, some people just will not believe any facts regarding Christ Jesus. But what do you and I say about the fact of Christ's transfiguration? About the fact that Peter, John, and James had that wonderful preview of Christ, the way he will look like when he returns. Do you accept as authoritative Peter's eyewitness account of Christ, the glorious judge? That was point one eyewitnesses. Here's the second solid ground on which Peter wants you and me to keep on believing in Christ's return. Trusted prophecy. In verses 20 and 21, Peter reminds us that Christ's return and judgment day have been prophesied. And surely you and I know there, there are many prophecy, prophecies in both the Old and the New Testament that have described that last day in clear and in no uncertain terms. But here is the point Peter wants to make absolutely clear, and that is that all these prophecies are to be trusted, for they came on authority of God. Yes, to be sure, these prophecies have been written down with human hands. However, by human hands, human intellects, human personalities and spirits that have been used and, and inspired by God's Holy Spirit. You see, it is not as if God used those prophets as passive mouthpieces or as puppets who have no brains and no will and no personality or talents of their own. No, after all. Look what Peter says in verse 21. He says, men, men spoke from God. Yes, men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. The Greek text literally says men carried along by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. My brother and sister, just as a sailboat gets carried along by the wind, and may I remind you that the word for wind and spirit in Greek is the same word. Just as a sailboat gets carried along by the wind, so were the Bible prophets carried along by the Holy Spirit, but with this difference. 
You see, where is the sailboat? It has no mind and no brain of its own. The words those human prophets used were genuinely the words of those prophets themselves. Words that those prophets consciously chose in accordance with their own vocabulary, what they have learned from they were little, in their own style, in their own circumstances. However, the words those prophets chose to use were also the very words that God wanted them to use to communicate the message He intended. Indeed, it's as, as 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 says, all scripture is God-breathed. It's God's breath. It's God's pneuma, the air, the wind coming out of His mouth. And so, what is Peter saying? Well, he says as much as this. Dear reader, those prophecies that speak of Christ's return as judge of heaven and earth, trust them all, for they come on highest authority. Yes, they come from God. If you don't trust them, you will have to face the consequences. My brother and sister, in verse 39, Peter says, So we have the prophetic word made more sure. What does he mean with that? Well, he means that what he and John and James witnessed on the Mount of Transfiguration made even more certain those trusted prophecies about Christ's coming in glory and power. And so, through those three human eyewitnesses, all Christians, the whole church, have now a double reason to believe the prophecies regarding Christ's return. Yes, we have the trusted, God-breathed prophecies, as well as the eyewitnesses' account. We want to conclude. So in conclusion, you and I have to ask, but what do we now do with this knowledge that Christ's return as judge of heaven and earth is real? It's going to happen. And what could, and we could ask this question in a twofold way. Firstly, what does the knowledge of Christ's return mean for the heartfelt Christian? Later on we'll ask another question. But what does Christ's return mean for the heartfelt Christian? Well, is it not so that every time when the Christian in this sin-marred world think of the Lord's return, his perseverance in faith gets boosted. I mean, is it not so that when Christ return, returns, He will make an end to the author of evil, and He will inaugurate the new heaven and earth, in which there will be no more pain, pain of whatever kind. There will be no more war, there will be no more death, and God will wipe away the tears from their eyes. Is this not why the Christian so relates to Romans 8, verse 23, which says, We ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies? And look, is this not why at times the Christian loves to pray with the Apostle Paul and the early church prayed? Maranatha, our Lord, come. Well, verse 19 says that during our often trialing days on earth, you and I should hold on to the prophetic truth as to a lamp 
when you and I walk in a pitch dark night, hold on to this prophetic word, to the whole Bible, as a lamp that shines in a dark place. After all, is not God's trusted word, as we sang earlier this morning, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Psalm 119, verse 105. And says Peter, pay attention to this word until that last day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. What does he mean with morning star? My brother and sister, remember how already in the days of Moses, the prophet Balaam said, a star will come out of Israel. Numbers 24, 17. Remember how Christ said about himself, and that was our call to worship this morning. I am the bright morning star. Well, Peter urges you and me to persevere in our God-given faith until Christ, the light bearer, dissipates the doubt and uncertainty by which our hearts are oftentimes beclouded, and he fills them with his marvelous light. That's what the return of Christ means for the Christian. But here is the scary part. What will Christ's return be for the man or the woman, the boy or the girl, who has not received him? For him or her who mocks and jokes about the ultimate judge's warnings about hell and about judgment? Does not our Lord himself say that for such people, there will be weeping and gnashing of the teeth. You ask, Pastor, so how shall we sum up the message of our text? In this very short sentence, man or woman, boy or girl, come let us live this day in light of that day. Amen. Let us.